Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Kirsten, and together with my sister, Lynn, we created the Anti-Racist Table, uh, which is a multi-dimensional platform uh, geared at helping people bring uh, anti-racism into life as a daily practice. We do this primarily with our free 30-day challenge, and we're very excited that we just recently upgraded our platform, uh, which makes it a lot easier to self-pace. We have uh, groups of people, organizations doing the challenge together. It's a wonderful way to take uh, concrete active steps to be the change that you wanna be in the world. Uh, the challenge provides uh, the framework. Uh, it also has tools that will help you deal with the emotionality that comes up as part of doing this work. Uh, you will be educated, you'll be motivated and inspired to uh, get out there and to be an ally and co-conspirator. Uh, now more than ever, uh, with the Capitol insurrection, the inauguration, uh, these past uh, few years, where we're seeing uh, such a divide among people, uh, we're so excited to have our guests today. Uh, people have firsthand experienced many of these things. And um, so the timing is perfect right now to hear from um, Professor Liliana Mason and the work she's doing with identity politics. Um, so before we introduce her, uh, Lynn is going to do our land acknowledgement. Lynn, you're on mute. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone for being with us today. Um, we would like to do a land acknowledgement as part of uh, our reparations with our relationship with indigenous people and communities. Um, we wanna recognize the land that we occupy, um, the colonialized land um, that was taken from the native peoples. Um, and we feel that this is the first step that we should be doing to bring awareness um, to these narratives that have been um, you know, really kind of swept under the rug. So this particular land acknowledgement um, is inspired by Ruth King. She's an African-American mindfulness practitioner and she inspires us every day. So I'd like to call on my ancestors to stand with me as I acknowledge the native custodians of this land. The colonizers called it Washington, DC. Um, it's actually the, Anna, the Anacostian land and the Piscataway people. Those people that are named, unnamed, known and unknown, past and present. We honor all of the traditions and the traditional custodians of this region. We recognize our continued connection to this land, to this water and to this community. We pay respect to the earth whose generous um, resources sustain us on a daily basis. We pay respect to the enslaved African people of this land who were brought, held, sold here and all of their descendants. And we pay respect also to all of the other people throughout the world who are living in captivity. We pay respect to their spiritual labor and we pay respect to our ancestors whose unwise relationship to race and racism we have inherited. We pay respect to our teachers and our elders past and present and emerging and to all of the young people today that are teaching us. We honor this gathering and all the people who have taken the time out to join us for this very important and timely conversation. We recognize that we all are striving and share an aspiration to be free and liberated in heart, mind, and body. Ashe, here ends our land acknowledgement. Thank you. Sorry, I just lost my I, uh, here we go, sorry. And now I'm gonna introduce our esteemed guest, Professor Mason. Liliana Mason is Associate Professor of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland College Park and the author of Uncivil Agreement, How Politics Became Our Identity. She received her PhD in political psychology from Stony Brook University and her BA in politics from Princeton University. Her research on partisan identity, partisan bias, social sorting, 
and American Social Polarization has been published in journals such as American Political Science Review, American Journal of Political Science, Public Opinion Quarterly, and Political Behavior, as well as uh, being featured in media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and the National Public Radio. Professor Mason received the 2017 Emerging Scholar Award from the Political Organizations and Parties section of the American Political Science Association, or APSA. Her work has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, and the Facebook Research Integrity Group. Uh, at this time, we usually uh, offer our guests to give their own land acknowledgement. And I'll just mention that Professor Mason is uh, also uh, coming from the same land that Lynn already uh, provided uh, the land acknowledgement for. And so with that, uh, welcome Professor Mason. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I am uh, I'm going to share some slides. This is, I, I'm, I am a college professor, so this may be um, a little bit like taking a class to some degree, but I hope it'll also be um, interesting and informative. Let me get this up. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is actually uh, a combination of this book on civil agreement uh, and what's hap what I'm doing, what I'm working on now, which is sort of how our partisan identities are actually fueling increasing amounts of um, violence and uh, disengage sort of moral disengagement from our uh, from from our partisan opponents and our fellow citizens. So the way I want to uh, sorry. Uh, the way I want to start this is this is a looks like a very boring graph, but um, but basically the puzzle that sets up the the uncivil agreement book is that uh, we aren't actually as a nation very polarized on our policy preferences. Um, if you look at this figure um, on the left, what you can see is I took a bunch of issue positions that are generally kind of contentious, including. Um, same-sex marriage, abortion, uh, um, uh, even uh, even something like the, uh, gun control, taxes. Uh, I took a bunch of issue to, issue positions together, and generally these issues range from kind of the the most liberal on every single issue. If you're the most liberal on every issue, you score zero, and if you are the most conservative on every single issue, you score one. So I just took sort of the average of people's issue positions across these five to six issues. And basically when, this is from 2016 data from the American National Election Studies, which is a nationally representative survey. What you can see is that uh, Republicans and, and Democrats actually don't have on average all that different issue positions and that even Republicans are to the left of the center on average across these very contentious issue positions. So the what this looks like is a is a picture of people who probably have a lot of room for compromise between them in terms of policy. And the figure on the right, um, I'm looking at sort of how well do people's uh, issue positions line up. So what percentage of, of issues are Republicans choosing the conservative side on? And what percentage of issues are Democrats choosing the liberal side on? Neither Democrats nor Republicans are very consistent in their issue positions, right? They have actually less than 50% choosing the kind of correct side of the policy spectrum for, um, for their answers to these policy preferences. So not only are people, are Democrats and Republicans relatively similar in their issue preferences, but they also don't have very consistent sets of issue positions, right? They're on the left, they're on the right, they're kind of all over the place. Uh, so that should be a picture of an electorate where we should have compromise, we should have a lot of things that we know we can kind of work together on and, um, and, and cooperate. If you look at it from an identity-based perspective, what we see is these are actually what we call feeling thermometers. So we ask people to rate Democrats and Republicans on a thermometer that ranges from zero, which is feeling very cold towards that group, to 100, which is feeling very warm towards that group. 
And what we see is Democrats feel about 27 degrees towards Republicans, which is cold, quite cold, and they feel about 75 degrees towards their own party, Democrats. Almost exactly the opposite for Republicans, right? They feel very warmly towards their own party and they feel very cold towards the other party. This is not a picture of an electorate that is all going to get along and be able to compromise. They truly dislike each other. And so the, the puzzle that, that I was confronted with was if we have so much policy-based agreement, and but yet we hate each other to such a degree, why? Like, where does the hatred come from? We're not actually disagreeing. Um, we, have, we have something else that's driving this hatred of each other. And so I decided to think about this from the perspective of social identity, uh, because social psychologists know that different groups can hate each other for all kinds of reasons, uh, many of which are not based in, you know, what, what should the government do? What types of policies should be enacted? What should be in the party platform? Those types of things are generally not the reason that social groups uh, hate each other or have intergroup conflict. So I turned to social identity theory. And this is a theory that was generated by a uh, social psychologist named Henri Tajfel, who was, um, he was actually going to become a chemist. He was in graduate school to become a chemist during World War II, he joined, uh, he, joined the, he joined the war and was captured by Nazi soldiers and spent six years in a Nazi prison camp, the entire time not telling anyone that he was Jewish. And he got away with this, and, but, and all he could think about while he was doing this was, they would kill me if they knew this one part of my identity, uh, but because they don't know it, they're not, gonna, they're not killing me. And so he came out of this experience deciding he was going to study intergroup conflict. So his first part of the project was to say, what is the lowest possible level of identifying with a group, the weakest possible level of identifying with a group that we can find so that the group will not feel any kind of animosity towards people in the other group, right? What's the weakest type of identity? So we asked people to look at a whole bunch of dots on a screen and he asked them to estimate the number of dots on the screen. He then asked people to allocate money to everyone else in the experiment. Um, let's say that, uh, you know, he, he's telling you that you, you've done this experiment. He's telling you you're an overestimator. Some people are underestimators, but that's it. You know, you looked at the dots, you overestimated. Uh, but now we're gonna do something else. We're gonna allocate money to people in the experiment. Okay, there you can choose. Uh, one condition in which both the overestimators and the underestimators are getting, let's say, $5, or a situation in which the overestimators get $4, but these lines don't line up, but it's okay. Imagine the overestimators get $4, but the underestimators get three. So essentially, you're paying a cost to win, right? To be victorious over the other group. Now, Tajfel expected that there would be absolutely no question everyone would choose the greater good because they just found out they were members of these groups. They have no attachment to them. They're actually sitting alone in a laboratory. They're never going to meet another person in the group. This should be the baseline where there's no intergroup conflict. And yet, over and over again, what Tajfel found was that people chose the, the in-group win condition over the greater good condition, even when they were just assigned these meaningless group identity labels. And he was relatively astonished. And in writing up these results, he said, it is the winning that seems more important to them. He was expecting the sort of bad conditions to make more conflict later. But now what he found was that even in the smallest, weakest identification with the group, we see this intergroup conflict, we see intergroup bias. There's something about the human um, psyche that needs the, the group that you're in to be victorious, to be better than another group. So now that we know this about, you know, a very weak identity, we can think about much stronger identities and imagine that this inclination to always want to win over, you know, benefiting everyone, that should be much stronger when we have these identities that are much more powerful for us. Things like our political party, our race, our religion, even our ideology can be, we, we take it on as an identity where um, people who call themselves liberals, people who call themselves conservatives really feel attached to that, other, to that group of people. 
So if all of these identities, so each of these identities can create that kind of like need to win. The issue is that if all of these identities are kind of independent from each other um, and are kind of, are not really, they don't, they're not connected to each other in your brain, then if one of them loses, for instance, then that it's that affects your psyche. It affects your sense of kind of self-esteem and self-worth because this part of your identity has has lost, but the other parts of your identity can still be considered, you know, unharmed. And so overall, your psyche is okay. However, if all of these identities become attached to each other, sort of sort of aligned, this is what I call sorting, sorting, then if one of those identities loses, it, it like infects the rest of these identities and it makes you feel like a loser on multiple levels. So as we lose an election, as our party loses an election, we don't just feel like our party is a loser, we feel like our racial group and our religious group and our ideological group, they're also losers and it takes up more of our kind of self-esteem real estate. So that that powerful sense of group identity is multiplied with every loss. And why is this important? Because uh, in the United States, we have been going through a process of what I call sorting, where this is a picture in 1972 uh, of the American electorate each of these lines just means, so this line means for, for men, this is the de difference between um, the percentage of Democrats and the percentage of Republicans who are men, <clears throat> excuse me, who are men. The, 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 if it goes to the right, they're more Republican. If it goes to the left, they're more Democratic. And the length of the line is the extent of the difference. Um, so in 1972, we see that um, men are about five percentage points more Republican than Democratic. Conservatives are substantially more uh, Republican than Democratic, same for liberals. You'll note that church attenders, there's zero difference um, between in, for church attenders. They're equally Democratic and Republican in 1972. Uh, still in 72, Southerners are, uh, are Democratic. Wealthy people tend to be more Republican. White, white people tend to be more Republican. Black people tend to be uh, more Democratic. Catholics are Democrats, Protestants, are Republicans, union members are Democrats, right? And this is sort of the thing, this is the setup that we've always, that we thought of, that we, we understand as, you know, what America kind of was in the 1970s, particularly with the Southern and church attendance um, uh, party differences. But another thing to remember here is that each of these differences is relatively small. So there isn't, uh, you know, a huge divide within each of these social groups. There's not a huge divide between Democrats and Republicans. The biggest divide that we see is that, you know, conservatives are a little over 20 percentage points more Republican than they are Democratic, but they still have Democrats who are calling themselves conservative. So what's changed? By 2016, these differences have exploded. And so not only do we see, you know, the gender gap increasing about three times, the, the difference between conservatives and liberals is huge. Church attenders and Southerners are now Republicans. The, the racial divide between the parties has doubled, actually more than doubled. So that now where we saw this small difference um, between in white people, between Democrats and Republicans. Now, white people are overwhelmingly more Republican than Democrat. And all religious people, um, Catholics and Protestant, just anyone who attends a church is, is more Republican. So instead of a lot of tiny differences, which we had in 1972, now we have huge differences on a few main divides, mainly ideological identity, religiosity, and race. So these are now these huge divides, which means our partisanship, our partisan divide is lining up with a racial divide and a religious divide and an ideological label divide. So what does this do to people's behavior? I've done a bunch of different experiments and I'm gonna talk about a couple of, of experiments later on in, the, um, in, in, a, in a minute, but this is just a simple experiment that I did where I had people read what I said was a blog post written by a partisan and it either, um, it, it, it basically said, um, you know, your party is the worst. You know, if, if it was a Democrat, it would say Democrats are losers and, um, you know, Barack Obama 
is a socialist and et cetera, et cetera. Some sort of insulting blog post. And then I asked people how they felt after they read it. And you don't have to worry about all of these labels, but basically what's important for you to understand is that the blue bars are people who have who are strong partisans with a lot of cross-cutting identities. They have very low levels of sorting, which means that you know they're a Democrat, but maybe um, but maybe they're also religious, right? Or maybe they're they also call themselves somewhat conservative. Uh, whereas the red bars are people who are strong partisans who have all of the associated identities that go along with their party. And what I found was that just from reading a blog post that threatened the party, the people who are in the blue bars reacted with almost zero anger, regardless of what their issue positions are, right? You can see across low, mean, and, and, and sort of low, average, and high issue position polarization, they just didn't react emotionally. Whereas the people who had all of the correct identities that were lined up with their party identity, they were furious. They had, they were top, topping out in a level of anger that they could even report, that I gave them to report. So just this difference of having either, you know, cross-cutting identities or these well-aligned identities, what that did was really create a difference in how people responded to threats and how people responded emotionally to feelings that their, the status of their group was under threat. So why does anger matter? Um, well, it can bring us to a bunch of different places, none of which tend to be good. I will say there is one place that anger can take us that is good, which is uh, political activism, right? So you can be angry. When people are angry, they tend to participate in politics more. The problem comes when they start to participate in politics on behalf of um, erroneous beliefs or, uh, or conspiracy theories or even just hatred of the other side. Um, the other problem is that anger pushes people into action that can be beyond political activism that can even take us into things like violence and hatred. So, so this is, that's sort of the setup of, of uncivil agreement. And, and in recent years, last three years, I've taken that and started with my colleague, Nathan Calmo, started looking into so what does this actually mean? How far can, how far can this go? The pe I know we know people, you know, rate each, rate each other, you know, coldly on a feeling thermometer, but what do they, you know, how, how deep is this divide? And, um, and is partisanship potentially even something that's driving people towards violence? So one thing that we have known over the last few years, and particularly we saw a lot of warnings over this last summer, is that uh, there have been increasing levels of political violence, particularly from right-wing uh, groups. And the, the in, for, for example, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in June wrote this, which is a relatively centrist think tank, wrote this you know, warning, this, this study that said they expect terrorism to increase uh, over the next year, in particularly in relation to the election, the 2020 election. Now, this is this is important to you know go back to what the psychology said. An election is a competition for status between groups. There is a winning side and there is a losing side, and particularly in our system of government with two parties, there is you know one side is is it's a zero sum game. One side wins and the other side has to lose. So when our party is, the status of our party is threatened by this election, and again, our racial identities, therefore, and our religious identities and our ideological identities come into, the, come into play with the outcome of the election, all of this psychological attachment to these groups is potentially fueling violence. And, and even these sort of centrist think tanks were worried about it over the summer. Obviously, we ended up two weeks ago seeing what actually can happen when there is, when people feel that their group's status is being threatened and that it's being threatened in an unfair and illegitimate way. So uh, so my co-author and I, this is hard to read, you don't have to read the whole thing, but my co-author and I decided to come up with a way to see if we could measure uh, 
how radical partisanship can be. How far are people going to go on behalf of their partisanship specifically because they have all this investment, this identity-based investment in the success of their party? So we decided to measure three different concepts. The first one we call moral disengagement. And that's really the precursor to violence for a lot of you know, studies of intergroup conflict. Moral, you have to be morally disengaged from another group in order to commit violence against them. So we asked, would you say the other party is a serious threat to the United States? Would you say they're evil? Um, they lack the traits to be considered fully human. They're animals, so dehumanization. We also look, looked at what we're calling partisan schadenfreude. You know, if you'd heard a politician have died of cancer, would your feelings about that depend on whether it was a Democrat or Republican? Do you ever think we'd be better off as a country if large numbers of older people in the other party would just hurry up and die sooner? All the way up to political violence, which is, you know, when is it okay to send, or if ever, is it okay to send threats to opposing party leaders? What about threatening regular people from the other party in, on the internet? Um, how much do you feel it's justified to use violence, for, for your party to use violence in advancing their political goals? And then what if the other party wins the 2020 election, then how much will it be justified? So we started asking these questions to nationally representative samples of Americans for uh, uh, really since 2017 is when we started measuring this. And what we found is that we have relatively stable trends in a lot of these things. So for moral disengagement, um, you know, we are seeing around 50 to 60% of Americans say that the other party is a serious threat to the United States and its people. Around 40 to 50% of Americans believe that the other people in the other party are evil. And around 20 to 30% of Americans believe that the other party behaves like animals. In terms of this idea of schadenfreude, oops, sorry. Uh, in terms of the idea of schadenfreude, we, uh, you know, between 15 and 30% of people think that the other part, people in the other party should hurry up and die, uh, all the way from November of 2017 to November of 2020. Be, uh, people would be more sad if, the, if their in-group leader had cancer between, you know, 10 20% of people uh, across the last three or four years. For the violence items, we've seen this really interesting pattern. Um, the last two data points here, this is October before the election of 2020, and this is November after the election, um, compared to you know, 2017, 2018, 2019. Um, and what we found is that for threats to leaders and other people, there's generally around 10% of people who think that it would be okay, at least a little bit. Uh, that number really, has declined since the election, which is an interesting thing. Um, in terms of thinking its violence will be justified if, uh, if, your, if your party loses the 2020 election, feelings about that have declined since the election. What has increased, the only thing that's increased, is the belief that violence is justified today for, by people in your party to advance political goals. And that level had started to be around, but you know, started off around 10% and is now increasing to, to around 20%. So we have 20% of American partisans who are believing that violence is acceptable, um, which is, you know, millions of people. Although it, as we saw from the Capitol attack, it, you know, it doesn't take millions of people to create a lot of chaos and danger. When we break it down by party, we don't see huge partisan differences. Um, you know, we, we ask, this is, this is uh, from the Democracy Fund in uh, December of 2019, we asked the same questions. And what we saw was, you know, 82% of Democrats said it's never okay to send threatening messages. 72% of Republicans said the same thing. 86% um, of Democrats said it's never okay to send to harassing messages to someone on the internet. 76% of Republicans said the same thing. And for election, for actual violence, basically identical numbers of Democrats and Republicans. You know, 84 to 85% said it's not okay today. And 78, 79% said, you know, it's not okay even if we lose the 2020 election. So we're keeping an eye on kind of you know, how, how does partisanship 
affect these attitudes. Now we know kind of how, how widely spread out they are or sort of how they're distributed in the American electorate. But what we're interested in is how do you predict the types of people who do believe that violence is okay? How do you identify those types of people? Uh, oh, before I say that, uh, we also wanted to know when we say violence, what were people thinking about? Because it's possible that they were not actually thinking about killing people. Uh, and so we had a research assistant go through we, responses to a question, which is, what did you mean when you said that? And we had some people saying any kind of violence, uh, you know, we're trying to stop a dictatorship revolution, 1776. We had some people use historical examples like tarring, tarring and feathering, uh, hanging, pitchforks. Uh, some people said 13% of the people who did explain some kind of substantive type of violence, they said uh, lethal violence, including any or mass death or some kind of lethal comment. Uh, overall, though, the people who are saying something that's explicitly about death was really only about two or three percent of people. So that's reassuring. But the rest of the people are saying things about um, punching, beating, throwing things, knocking people out. 15% uh, of people chose punching or throwing things. 5% talked about actual property destruction. So that's something that isn't necessarily um, lethal, right? It isn't hurting another person, it's just destroying property. Some people said berating people, you know, just being, um, using verbal aggression. Some people said protests, which we don't actually count as violence. Um, and a few people said, you know, I would, I would support um, punching people, but that's as far as I'll go, right? They said, this is the limit. So that's, a we think that this is a little bit uh, reassuring and that even the people who say violence, say that it's okay to participate in violence are not really thinking about killing everybody, but they, but they are talking about violent things. Some, many are talking about violent things. So what types of people are the most likely to, uh, to talk about these, these uh, to approve of violence and, and also disen moral disengagement from other partisans? What we find is, um, in order to read this, this is a, a coefficient plot from a regression. You don't need to know what either of those things mean. Just basically, the zero line is there's no effect. Um, it, if, the, if the dot is to the right of the zero line, it means there's a positive effect. And if it's to the left, it means there's a negative effect. So basically, if you have a stronger partisan identity, if you feel, if you feel strongly socially attached to your party, you're more likely to endorse partisan violence. Uh, the main predictor also, this is important, is just what we call trait aggression. People who are generally violent and aggressive in their lives. We said, you know, have you ever hit a person? How, is it easy for you to get angry? You know, how often do you yell at other people? Unrelated to politics, the people who say that they tend to be aggressive people are more likely to uh, approve of violence. But the other thing, the other only significant predictor of, of participating in violence is feeling strongly socially attached to your party. Uh, similarly, we see for people who are morally disengaged from the other party, people who are strongly identified with their social, uh, with, their, with their party, people who are strongly identified with their ideological group, liberals or conservatives, and again, people who, who are just aggressive people in general tend to be morally disengaged from the other party. Um, interestingly, education reduces moral disengagement. So people who are more highly educated actually tend to do, um, be less willing to say things like the other party is evil, they're a threat, they're animals. Uh, we also really wanted to know about the effect of racism and sexism on these kind of violent attitudes and, and moral disengagement against the other side. So we measured this is the, this racial, the racial resentment scale is a scale that is very commonly used in political science. It is made up of these items. We did not make these up. This is a scale that just is, you know, a very common scale. Basically what this measures is, do you believe that systemic racism exists? That's effectively what it measures, right? Irish, Italians, Jewish, and many other minorities overcame prejudice and worked their way up. Blacks should do the same without any favors. And these are, these items are just, you know, agree or disagree. 
we also have, um, okay, so what is the effect of racial resentment? Here is a picture of uh, scores of racial resentment. So people who are down at this end at zero, they, they are you know, not racially resentful at all. They, they believe that systemic racism exists. And the people who are at one are the most racially resentful, okay? Uh, what we did was we looked at levels of moral disengagement for Democrats and Republicans across levels of racial resentment. Which means if you look at the line with the circles, this is this, these are Democrats. What we're seeing is for Democrats who are not at all racially resentful compared to those who are highly racially resentful, in fact, their moral disengagement from Republicans decreases a little bit. They become more sympathetic to Republicans as they become more racially resentful. The opposite effect, and to a large degree, is happening among Republicans, where Republicans who are um, not at all racially resentful are, feel much more morally close to Democrats. And Republicans who are very highly racially resentful feel that Democrats are animals and evil and threats to the United States. So part of the reason for this is that on average, Democrats tend to be lower than, tend to be lower in racial resentment than Republicans are. This is just, these are the scores that they scored in our, in our sample. So for Democrats, being essentially, being racist is a cross-cutting attitude for them because it's not consistent with their partisan identity. And for Republicans, being racist is a consistent and aligned attitude with their party because it's, it's, it's a common attitude within their party. So as Republicans feel more racially resentful towards African-Americans, towards Blacks, they believe that Democrats are more evil. And that's a consistent attitude. So it's similar to sorting, only it's sorting not just on identity, but also on racism itself. We also looked at this for sexism. Um, there is what's called a hostile sexism scale, again, commonly used, we didn't make it up, but agree or disagree with things like most women fail to appreciate what men do for them. Um, women seek to gain power by getting control over men, these types of things. And again, what we find is that the people who are down here at zero are so they do not, they are not sexist at all. The people who are at one are the most sexist on all three of those questions. And again, for Democrats, there's really no effect of sexism on their idea about Republicans, right? They, it doesn't matter whether it's a sexist Democrat or a not sexist Democrat, they kind of feel the same about Republicans no matter what. But for Republicans, those who are not sexist at all actually are more sympathetic towards Democrats. And those who are highly sexist are not at all sympathetic towards Democrats. They're much more likely to say that Democrats are evil, a threat to the country um, and animals. So again, part of the reason for this is that on average, Democrats score relatively low on the sexism scale and on average Republicans score much higher on the sexism scale. And therefore, the, the feeling of sexism, the, the new sort of uh, sexist attitudes are cross-cutting identities for Democrats and they are aligned, sorted identities for Republicans. And that changes the way that Democrats and Republicans think about each other. Simply whole, or particularly Republicans think about Democrats by being racist or sexist that actually increases Republicans feelings of social distance or feelings of moral distance from, from Democrats. So it's, it, there's a combination of identities and also um, intergroup hostility that, that Republicans are feeling. Or not even intergroup hostility, but simply prejudice uh, that, that, are, that is really fueling Republican moral disengagement from Democrats. Um, so we also wanted to see and we can talk about that later in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, we also wanted to see what makes um, these violent views worse. So not just what types of people tend to believe in these things, but also is there something that makes it worse? There was a week in 2018 when we had the, the Tree of Life uh, Tragic Synagogue shooting. And at the same week, 
the man who was sending uh, pipe bombs to prominent Democrats, that happened in the same week. We just happened to have a survey in the field during that week. And so we can measure before and after uh, people's views about political violence. What we found is um, before the, the week of attacks, we had relatively low approval of violence as we tend to see. Um, but then during the week of attacks, because these were attacks, you know, against, first of all, the bombs were against Democrats and the, and the synagogue shooting was related to immigration attitudes, which is tends to be um, a partisan issue. So what we saw was that the blue line is Democrats. Um, the week of the attacks, Democrats grew, grew somewhat more approving of violence. And the week after the attacks, Democrats grew significantly more approving of violence. Republicans also grew more approving of violence after that week. So just having a violent, um, a series of violent events can actually increase people's approval of partisan or political violence. And the only good news is that the, that effect disappears very quickly. So the you know, pro-violent attitudes shoot up and then they go back down very quickly. So ideally that shouldn't be a permanent um, problem. Um, the other, uh, Another thing that we found is that messages, this is, a, this is great news, M messages from leaders help. So we, we ran an experiment. We had the people read a quote from Biden that said violence directed at anyone because of their political opinions is not okay. Or, you know, America, America is strong, we're united, we always move forward. Sort of this, you know, kind of, um, we're all Americans type of message. So either anti-violence message or we're all Americans type of message. We also have people read messages from Trump um, that where these were sort these were like press releases from his office, but technically they, they came from um, presumably came from him. But so we had people read um, anti-violence and you know pro-America or we're all Americans messages from both Biden and Trump. And what we found was so here we have partisan identity strength. So this, this, the, the amount that you identify with your party. Uh, for people, so this is the gray line is the control condition who didn't read any messages at, at all. So the stronger the partisan, generally, the more people approve of violence. As we saw before, partisan identification increases political approval of political violence. But this is really important. When people read an anti-violence message from a leader, and this worked particularly for Biden, it didn't work as well for Trump, but when people read an anti-violent message from a leader, the strongest partisans became the least approving of violence. So the people who are most strongly identified with their party and therefore the most likely to, to approve of political violence, they also are much more likely to listen to their leaders when their leaders say things that are anti-violent. So that's a really important thing to consider as our leaders, because we, if we're loyal to our party, that can create bad things, but it can also create um, opportunities for us to reduce partisan violence if our leaders are willing to talk that way. I think Biden certainly did. Um, okay, so to kind of close up, um, what do we do now? What, what can we expect for the future? There's a clearly a pessimistic case to be made, um, which is that we have scholars who study civil wars in other countries. And one of the, one of the uh, you know, predominant predictors of a civil war uh, breaking out in a country is that they have a, a convergence of racial, ethnic, religious, and cultural and, and partisan divides. And that is consistent across multiple countries, multiple civil wars. So we are in a position in which civil war is actually more likely because we have all of these aligned identities. And also the last time uh, that our partisan divide fell along racial policy lines, which effectively was uh, over slavery, we ended up in a civil war. Okay, so that's not good. Also, the last time there was a major legislative attempt to increase racial justice, uh, that was the 1960s. We, are, we were going through a huge amount of social tumult. There were assassinations. There was a lot of social chaos. So these are um, not, not promising uh, pieces of, of context. However, the optimistic case is that 
particularly among white Democrats, we have seen massive changes in racial attitudes over the last decade, particularly among uh, white Democrats, but actually we've seen changes even among white Republicans, believing things like the country needs to continue making changes to give blacks equal rights with whites. Uh, white people in general have, have you know, uh, have seen, you know, 2009, 50% of white people agreed with that. By 2017, 80% of white people agreed with that. For Democrats in particular, they went from 57% to 81%. And Republicans went from 30 to 36, so that's something, some movement. Um, in general, white, white Democrats are really consi consistently pro-equal um, uh, rights and civil rights. The you know, Democrats overwhelmingly believe that we haven't gone far enough in giving Black people equal rights with whites. Um, Democrats overwhelmingly believe that, the white Democrats, overwhelmingly believe that the legacy of slavery affects the position of Black people today. And Democrats overwhel overwhelmingly believe that when it comes to racial discrimination, the bigger problem for the country is people not seeing discrimination where it really does exist. Now, the overwhelming majority of Republicans believe that the bigger problem is seeing discrimination where it does not exist. But, but at the very least, we're seeing a large change among, among white Democrats in the country. And so potentially what we're seeing is this radicalization of American partisanship in a process of becoming a, a multiracial and fully representative society. Um, we can imagine, right, when, when, a, when our parties are divided over the systemic oppression of people who are not white and or men, um, provides a really powerful voice to, to one side of the debate that really hasn't been empowered before. When you have, there's never really been an entire political party that says, you know what, the traditional social hierarchy is not working for us. We are not, it's not democratic and we need to do something to change it. We've never seen that type of political power before behind that argument. However, uh, if we were to have a sort of reckoning with our history and our legacy of racial violence and racial oppression, uh, we would expect to see a backlash, a huge backlash. I don't think any reasonable person would not expect to see a backlash to this. And, and so, and we would expect that backlash to occur mostly among people who benefit the most from the traditional social hierarchy. So, those who hold very strong white identity, those who hold very strong male identity, and people whose individual status and sense of self-worth is, is, not, is not individually high. And so they need to use these white and male identities to sort of make them feel themselves like they have high status. This is connected to the W.B. Du Bois concept of the wages of whiteness, right? You may not have money, you may not have a good job, but, uh, but you have this you have uh, this increased status in society uh, and, and therefore you're not at the bottom and you should be grateful for that and you should be proud of that, right? So we would expect to see these, these, this backlash coming particularly from these people. And that's generally what we are seeing right now. This is sort of you know, where, um, where, we are, where we are seeing these conflicts happen it, right, like right now in particular in relation to Trump and Trump supporters. So it is possible that we are in the process of creating a more egalitarian and just society, but we know that there will never be a straight, easy path to that. We will all, there will always be people fighting against it. Um, and so maybe the optimistic case is that we are on the bumpy part of the road that we have to get through to get to the smooth part of the road. Um, the only question, and this is where I kind of um, I'm not sure what the answer is, is whether or not we can keep our democracy going as we get through this change, as we get through this um, sort of reckoning with the, with the country's legacy of racism and racial violence. Um, but we can talk about that together. So thank you very much. I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your questions and comments. Wow, that was phenomenal. Um, so many things to think about. We have a lot of great questions in the Q&A. 
So maybe we should jump right in there. Um, but, but, but I think because we're, we're at 352, I really wanna ask, you know, what, what do you think we can do? I mean, this, you know, the racial resentment, the, the slide where you have with the, with the moral disengagement and, you know, just the seeds of civil war that really harken back to uh, slavery. Um, yeah, what do, you, what do you think, is there anything that we can do to help turn the tides? I mean, that's really the work that we're trying to do with the anti-racist table is to, is to bring people in and to help educate them. But, you know, do you even see that as something that is something we can do? So I do think that there, I mean, I think just looking at the attitudes of white Democrats over time is, is something that, you know, should give us some hope. Um, now, we don't know whether white Democrats are actually willing to kind of put their money where their mouth is and, you know, do things like segregate their, desegregate their neighborhoods and schools and those types of things, right? Um, but I do, I do think that, you know, and Biden actually said something during his inaugural address that was, I think, that was really resonant, which was, he said, if enough of us, and then he repeated himself, enough of us are willing to do the work, then we can make progress. And, and he, he really was at that, he was, what he was saying was, it doesn't take everybody. We don't all have to be on board, right? We just have to have enough of us on board. We've never had everybody on board, right? We didn't have everyone on board for the Civil Rights Act. We didn't have everybody on board um, for Reconstruction, which then of course was uh, terribly ended, but, um, but there's never been everybody agreeing that, that we're gonna make progress. And, and I think that the only way to move forward with this is just to say, how can we get enough of us, right? And the, and the fact that we do have an entire political party who is really moving in, in, in the direction of social justice, that's more power than, than it's ever had before, than the concept of social justice has ever had before. So, you know, bringing more people on board with that, you know, helping Americans get comfortable with this idea of social progress. I think, you know, what you're doing is really, is, is really helpful because it's just adding to the number of people who, who can be on board. Thank you. Well, that's just, you know, a call to everybody out there that this is the call of our time. This is history. This moment is, is counting on you to get out there. So I want to just turn to some of these questions. Um, so let's see, uh, has profess does Professor Mason have any ideas or theories on why the social sorting changed so significantly from 1972 to 2016? And then uh, with that same question is what insights uh, does your research tell us or explain the recent events at, uh, on the Capitol? Yeah, so the, the, so the sorting occurred partially because there was a partisan realignment around race. Um, based, it, it started with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which alienated a huge portion of the Democratic Party, which was conservative white Southerners. And that group of people, there were, none of them were Republicans because of the Civil War, actually. The, the white South was entirely Democratic. And when the Democratic Party passed the civil rights legislation, these white Southerners were furious and over a span of a generation, because partisanship is such a strong identity, it took a generation. But over the span of a generation, those people left the Democratic Party and moved into the Republican Party. So there was this really big racial shift that happened gradually over decades. At the same time in the 1980s and 90s, the religious right was really courted by the Republican Party who knew that they had power there, that the religious right was really powerful and it was not mobilized at all. And so they saw the advantage of that. And so they went out and started courting the religious right. So then we have this religious sorting, right? So, um, so, and at the same time, we also have the advent of partisan cable news and the internet. Those happen, those both happened during that period of time as well, which made that sorting even easier. And then finally, um, you know, I think the final, the final uh, straw was Obama's presidency itself. A lot of research has, has shown that not, it's not because of anything Obama did, but simply because he was a black man in the Oval Office, 
people who were not paying attention to politics and didn't really care about it, they could learn about who was in the Democratic Party simply by seeing the front page of the newspaper, right? Or just seeing a picture of the president. That taught really low, low education, low attention, white Americans, what the Democratic Party looks like. And that created a racial backlash, a white racial backlash to the Democratic Party. And Trump then came along and really just kind of said everything out loud, right? He stopped the dog whistles. He was just like, yeah, we're going to be racist. And that's what, that's what this is. Um, so he made it very clear. But so that was that's sort of the gradual story. In terms of the Capitol attack, um, I, you know, I was just actually talking with my co-author about this today. It, we know that, you know, for these sort of these terrorist attacks, we we see that attitudes towards violence increase, approval of violence increases in the in the immediate aftermath. We have seen YouGov did a, did a survey like three hours after the attack and they found that something like 40 something percent of Republicans approved of it. And then a couple days, like maybe a week later, ABC did a poll and found that only 15% of Republicans approved of it. So it does seem like among Republicans, approval of violence went up and then straight down again, like we saw in our data. We're not sure whether it's, you know, whether that happened, I, we don't think that happened for Democrats at all. And we're also not sure about how to interpret this when it's an attack on the seat of government for, you know, for people who feel that they are patriots to be attacking the seat of government is such a strange thing to be waving American flags and, and desecrating um, your own, your own Capitol building um, was just a really bizarre uh, event. And so I think for some people, it was just possibly very confusing and they're not sure what to, what to make of it. Yeah, I was wondering wow. because of that, do you think that this radicalized section of the Republican party that is like kind of like the Trump party, is that gonna be like a breakaway party? Cause I feel like a lot of the, you know, more concert, more like not, um, not conservative, but like more mainstream Republicans kind of felt like an awaken, like, oh, you know, this is getting too far. Like we need to, you know, come back to trying to come towards some kind of unity that I feel like now they're going to be kind of at odds within their party. Do you think there's going to be a breakaway of this kind of more radicalized Republican party like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley and those people? Yeah, Trump, I think Trump has already started talking about starting a patriot party. That's what he's calling it. Um, the, the thing about American, the American electoral system is that we are like institutionally and structurally, we are always going to have two parties. We, we can't last very long with three parties because we don't have proportional representation. So, you know, when 51% of people gets 100% of a seat, that's, you know, you're always going to end up with two parties because it's people engaged in strategic voting. There are, you know, if you, if we had 15% of people getting 15% of the seats, then we could have a lot of parties, but we, we don't have that system. And so um, ultimately, I think that the, I think that the best possible outcome for this would be if uh, these sort of more moderate Republicans created their own caucus within the party that voted with Democrats every once in a while, um, which would then kind of weaken the Trump-ish type of Republicans. That actually would be sort of similar to what we saw happen with the Southern Democrats in the 1960s and 70s, right? Where a portion of the party starts to move away, creating this realignment. And during the period of realignment, we actually have pretty low polarization, right? We have less partisan hostility during that period because we have a lot of cross-cutting identities. And so, I, you know, I think possibly the best scenario would be if we had I, I think that they should call themselves unity Republicans because they keep talking about unity, you know, these Republicans that are actually are going to say like, you know, we think that democracy is good and we, we believe in not disenfranchising people and, um, and we think that people should have votes, right? So if they would vote with, with Democrats every once in a while, we, we might see some kind of realignment, which really would take down the temperature. But do your, um, does your research in that slide on the moral disengagement and the racial resentment, do, do, does that match up that that's really a fringe element or is it, is it bigger? So it's, I mean, that's across everyone who identifies as Republican. But the, I mean, the important thing to, to remember about that graph is that at the low end of racism and sexism, Republicans are less morally disengaged than Democrats are, 
right? So the Republicans who are low racism and low sexism are actually some of the most sort of least polarized and most, most open and least violent people in America. So that those people have a lot of power. The problem is right now that they're only, you know, they're a small percentage of the Republican party, right? The on average Republicans scored a 0.7 out of one on our racism scale, whereas Democrats scored a 0.3 out of one. So we don't have that many Republicans who, who feel that way, but, but they are there and they could possibly be a good reservoir for that. All right, thank you so much. We're over, it's 4.02 and I, I wanna give you a chance um, before we talk about our next events, if there's anything um, else you wanted to plug about your work, where, where people, what's the best place for people to buy your book? Um, uh, you, well, you can, you can go straight to University of Chicago Press to buy the book, or you can buy it on Amazon. Um, you can, you can, you know, get it most places online. Um, I am uh, Lily Mason PhD on Twitter, uh, L-I-L-Y Mason PhD. Uh, and you can follow me there. I'm working, I'm trying to finish up this book manuscript for our next book, which will be coming out um, hopefully within a year called Radical American Partisanship, which is basically a lot of this stuff that I said in the, in the second half of the talk, just looking at it more in depth. Okay. Can't wait to read it. Very excited. Thank you so much for being here. We uh, just want to uh, tell people about our upcoming events. Lynn has a slide she's just going to share. Uh, we encourage everybody to go out and get uh, Professor Mason's book. Um, we're going to have this talk on available. I know I'm going to go back and watch it again. Um, so we've got Julie Lifcott Haynes this Sunday. Um, after that, we've got Alexa Martin and then Michael Steele and then Dr. Peggy McIntosh. And you can check out our website and hear about uh, other upcoming events and watch any of our previous conversations. Um, and of course, check out our challenge, share it with a friend. Um, you all heard Professor Mason's just really powerful and dynamic talk today, which really underscores how important this work is. And um, you know, now's the time to get out there and stand with your values and stand for humanity. So thank you, and we hope to see you again. Bye. Yes, thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.